Hello and welcome back. So what I want to do today is start looking at EMI debugging techniques and in particular using electrical field near field probes. Basically if you're involved in designing any sort of electronic commercial product to be able to put it on the market you will have to pass certain EMC compliance tests. Both emissions tests and immunity tests. Now especially with emissions tests, basically you will be looking at the emissions of the product in a wider spectral range and if you're below the limits everybody's happy, if you're above the limits then you have a bit of a problem. Now the main issue with interpreting the results that you get from an emissions test is that it will tell you exactly the frequency at which you have your problem but it won't really tell you where exactly on your unit the problem is coming from. I mean, if your unit is really simple, it has like 20 components, then it's usually obvious where the noise is coming from. But if you work on a really complex board with lots of circuits interconnected and so on, pinpointing the exact location of the noise isn't really an easy task. And this is where near-field probing techniques come into play. So if you're curious about what this near-field thing is and what sort of results you can get using an electrical field probe, then keep watching. So how does this near field thing work? I mean, what is near field? Well, to try to explain that, I got this little diagram here. So if you have power supply powering any sort of load, you will have a current going through the wires. And any current going through a conductor will create a magnetic field around that conductor. Now also to supply your load, you have a positive terminal and a negative terminal. So you will have electrical charges on the wires. And that will create an electrical field between the opposing charges. Now, if your circuit is working in DC, then nothing really interesting is happening. But on the other hand, if you have AC, alternating current, as long as you're close to the circuit, you will be able to measure the two fields. So the magnetic field and the electrical field. And being close to the circuit where you can measure these, you will be in the near field. If you move further away from the circuit, you will only be able to measure the combined wave, the electromagnetic wave, which is a combination between the electrical field and the magnetic field. And the separation between the near field and the far field is roughly at around the wavelength divided by 2 pi. So depending on the frequency of the wave, the separation line is closer or further. So if your radiated emissions tests for EMC are performed usually in the far field, why would you bother measuring in the near field? Well, other than the distance you need to be away from the circuit to be able to measure your far field signal, Another inconvenience can be the antenna size. So if you're working in the gigahertz range, then you will be working with small, tiny little antennas. But if you want to measure something at a lower frequency, so in the megahertz range or hundreds of kilohertz, then you need really, really big antennas. And on the other hand, if you try to measure something in the near field, you don't really need that big of a setup. Let me show you what I mean. So to start off, we need to generate some controlled electrical fields. So we have something to measure. So I built this thing. Basically it's a capacitor with a BNC connector here on the back. So I have this thing plugged into the signal generator which is on the back side and then also to the second channel of the oscilloscope so we can see the signal that we're injecting. And from a constructive point of view we have a live terminal here in the middle and then the ground is connected to the two terminals on the side and also the bottom so that it won't radiate too much outside so most of the electrical field is sort of contained in here. Now regarding the dimensions of this thing if you want to build one well my main concern was to what sort of PCB scraps do I have lying around so I didn't really take any sort of specific measurements into consideration I just built this thing with whatever I had lying around. Now to measure the electrical field you could make an absolute field strength probe something that would give you an a uniform value throughout this entire area 
but that's too complicated and that's not really what we need. On the other hand, the way normal electrical field commercial probes work is by creating a capacitive link to the live wire and then connecting this to ground through a high impedance load and measuring the voltage drop on it. So the easiest way of doing this without having to bother too much is to simply take any sort of shielded wire with a bit of it exposed at the tip. So one implementation of that would be your regular oscilloscope probe. I mean this thing has shielding up until the very tip where you have a few millimeters of exposed live wire. So to try out the electrical field probe you can simply insert it inside of the electrical fields and you will be able to see on the oscilloscope that we do get a response. It's a very small response so I'm supplying the cell with almost 11 volts of peak to peak signal whereas the probe is only detecting roughly 10 millivolts of peak to peak signal but since this probe relies on capacitive coupling it follows the rules of a capacitor. So the smaller the distance between the terminals the stronger the signal so the closer I move to the live terminal the stronger my signal gets the further away the smaller it becomes. And also just like a capacitor if I try to increase the surface area with a bit of aluminum tape we will see that we have a much much stronger response. So even though there is some distance to the live terminal my signal is already going out of the range that I can measure. Now it's important to mention at this point that to measure the electrical field you don't necessarily have to be in between the two terminals, so between the live terminal and ground, because most likely if you're trying to measure a PCB, the live terminal will be some sort of trace on the PCB and the ground will be maybe an internal layer or the other side. So you can't really put anything in between. So you can also measure the signal even if you're coming to it at a different angle. But as you can see there's quite a lot of noise so there's the 50 hertz noise also going on and that's basically because my probe is also picking up noise from the environment so not just what my electrical field generator is generating but also things from around. And finally if we want to discuss bandwidth a good electrical field probe should have a very wide bandwidth and as flat as possible. So a good commercial probe will go up into the gigahertz range. So having a 3 gigahertz probe is not uncommon. Now if we check out my probe, we see that at 1 kilohertz it's sensing about 25 millivolts of peak to peak signal. If we increase this to 10 kilohertz, well the signal slightly goes up 32 millivolts, 100 kilohertz still around 32-33 millivolts, at 1 megahertz still the same, 5 megahertz still 30 something but my input signal starts to decrease. So all in all this sort of works but the point is that the probe's bandwidth doesn't depend on its size. So unlike an antenna it's not dependent on the wavelength of the signal you're trying to measure. The only thing that matters is the impedance of the cable and the equipment it's plugged into. So the whole system works like a high pass filter. You've got your capacitance between the probe and the circuit you're probing and then a low side impedance caused by the cable and the equipment. So the higher this impedance is, the lower the frequencies that you can measure. So now let's see how this thing can actually work on a practical circuit. So what sort of information can we get from a practical circuit using this sort of probing technique. And for that we can look at the audio board that I'm using to make my recording so if you hear some sort of cracks or noises during this recording, it's probably because I touched something I shouldn't have. Anyway, I set the oscilloscope to FFT mode so we can see whatever we're probing in a frequency domain. So we can see the actual frequencies that are present in the circuit. Now I won't be using the probe on its own so only with this very sharp tip, but rather I made a set of probe tips. Now any good set of electrical field probes will have multiple shapes and sizes. And the idea behind this is that 
When you don't really know exactly what you're looking for or where exactly it is on the board, you're going to be using a large probe tip. So something that can cover a large area. So for that I built this thing. This will be helpful to go over the board, look for areas of interest, and once the area is found, you go to a smaller probe tip. So with this you can actually pinpoint the exact location of the noise source. Now the third type of probe that I made was this long version. Basically the idea behind this is that if you have long traces that carry a lot of noise and you want to extract only this noise and eliminate whatever is around, then you can take this sort of probe to look over the trace over its entire length. So let's try this out, see what we can find. So take my probe, go over the board, we can see some spikes appearing here and there. So we can see that in this area where we have the audio chip, I have a spike going on at around 300 something kilohertz. So this is probably the charge pump from the IC. If I take my smaller probe tip now and look around the IC, we can see that on its upper right side, the spike is much, much higher. But if I move to the underside, then the spike is no longer present. So using these probes, I can pinpoint the upper area of the chip as having the most emissions. Now, if we look in a different frequency range, go over to the IC a bit, we see some spikes appearing. So if I go with my cursors around, we see that we have a very clear spike going at around 6 megahertz. This is basically because of the quartz crystal, so it's not really a surprise that we have a spike going on. I would have expected that to be the biggest one, but it's probably because of the way the FFT is working. So to make a proper analysis, you would require a proper spectrum analyzer. If we try the small probe, go over the same region. This time we clearly see a spike appearing at around 5.45 megahertz. So this is probably some sort of harmonic appearing from this area. And if we look in lower frequency spectrum, go over the USB lines, see a bunch of spikes appearing in this area. These are coming from the data packages going between the USB chip and the computer. And now if we take the long probe, we can get a very nice response by going over the USB lines. We sort of get a nice response. Doesn't seem to be cooperating today. It's summer around here, so it's really hot. So basically, this is the sort of thing that you can do with near field electrical field probes. You can go into your circuit and look for the emission sources and try to pinpoint their exact locations. So to see exactly which are the traces or component groups that are emitting in a certain frequency range. Now to do this, of course, there are proper commercial probes that have wide bandwidths. Usually you will also need a preamplifier. So to amplify the very small signal coming from the probe and the proper spectrum analyzer. Now you can get away with an oscilloscope and an FFT mode, but the proper spectrum analyzer will most definitely give you much better results. And that about covers electrical field probes. Next time we'll be looking at magnetic field probes. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.